and it's honestly an honor to be able to talk to you all. I gave this talk, what, 2019? I think it was 2021, actually. 2021? So it was more recent than I realized. Yeah. That's crazy, because I have now gotten to a point where I'm so ridiculously busy that it's awesome that I have an EA, but I just ran here to try to get things done. And I thought it would be kind of nice to include what I mentioned last time, blitz through that start, and show where I am now. So, like Lachlan said, I studied physics. I actually started my first degree in UQ, um, doing a Bachelor of IT. And then I fell asleep during the information systems lecture because they were trying to talk about a table and make it complicated. This is ridiculously boring. So I decided to do something harder. And I liked physics. My dad was a physicist. And they taught me how to see the world in a beautiful way. I've always enjoyed that. So I just followed that excitement and I kept going. So these first sets of slides are going to be really a lot, which I'm going to skip over because I really want to get to the stuff at the end here. But the first one here, if I click on. Oh, sorry. Nope. Is it working OK? Or? Oh, yeah, there we go. That there is a link to a slide deck that I would give at NYSF. I don't know if you've heard of the National Youth Science Forum. But basically, it talks about how you go from literally where we are in nature now and observing to get the standard model of particle physics, and then I'll use that to describe stuff. Like that. You know, if I can, how can I actually open this link, or will it destroy things? Or do I even bother? Uh, it should destroy things. If you just so, the, does that work? If you click on the only thing I don't want to do, yeah. will it ruin your recording? Uh, no, I think it's okay. <laughs> no, it's not sharing. Oh, we can move it up to there. So, is this what you want up on the? The only thing I want to show is the last slide, actually. Okay, if you just skip through, can you just access the last slide directly from there? Just slide number Oh, God. You know LinkedIn slide share? Add that ad. So let's screw that. Okay. That's not the Basically, at the very end of it, though, there's this beautiful picture that's from XKCT that shows um, a picture of the birds and nature. And then next to it, it shows the birds and nature and all of the beautiful equations of physics next to it. Um, I should just send it to you, that XKCD image. You should, could share it around. I can share it with the class. That's a really beautiful image. And that's something that I think that I've always seen physics as part of my identity. And science as part of my identity. And um, this here, this picture here, is eventually when I kept doing physics because it was exciting, I fell into a PhD doing physics and nuclear physics particularly. And these here, that's on my left, is with me ready. And over there in the background, that's Mahas and Surya Bandara. Me at the front there with my hands on my face, pressing out, that's me. This was us during our first year of our PhD, doing what PhD students do best, and that is procrastinate. And um, we actually weren't doing physics here at all. In the background there, that is us trying to solve a problem to optimize the transport network of campus. And how do we end up doing this is that um, we're just kind of going about our business in some ways and wanted to do something fun. And then we learned about these things called hackathons, where people put up problems. And then you go ahead and solve them. And it turned out that our skill set as physicists, and maybe it's a bit of our arrogance with our skill set as physicists, allowed us to be able to just take on some problem, understand it really quickly, and try to solve it. So these were really intense times. These are around in 2017, I guess. When I say intense, I mean like you have a weekend to solve a problem. And the thing that we liked to do and what we enjoyed about it is being able to build something and a solution really quickly and actually get something that has a real world impact, which honestly, I would say my PhD research was measuring the lifetime states of nuclear states very, very quickly. They would last picoseconds, a million times faster than you can and I would think to myself, what is this really useful for? I love it. And I think um, we, I enjoy being able to apply those skills in data analysis, understanding, those same things. Just I see the world. I can turn it to math and actually solve some real problems. 
Next slide. So this, that was from GovHack, and um, we won, which was great. We won quite a few times, actually. We just kept winning. We kept doing these, and we just kept winning. And it became a bit of a joke. We um, won so much that we stopped because it just became unfair for everyone else, to be honest. Uh, there's some other ones, like that other trophy there is from Unearthed. And Unearthed was a, another sort of one that was great because it's a cool trophy, and we won $10,000. It was awesome. We learned something that this skill set that we had as a team of these three, Prithi, Mahas, and myself, we worked really well together, and that actually people just wanted to hire us straight away. That was, yeah, 2017 still. And we always had this idea and dream, though, that we could do something more. Like, actually, it was 2016, after we finished our honors years, um, Prithi was actually in on exchange, and um, then the Arab Spring happened. I don't know if you know about the Arab Spring, but basically the world was going crazy. And Trump was coming into power, all this sort of stuff. He was sad. He called me when he was overseas, and we were chatting. And um, he eventually we spoke about like this, this dream that we had, which was to one day have a company that would be able to use science and apply it to try to do as much good and change this world as much as we can. Um, we didn't really talk about it much at all. Um, but then with this there and the fact that people wanted to hire us, it kind of just fell into an opportunity. And um, we founded a company called Thorm in 2018. And founding Thorm when you haven't had a real job in your life and starting a company is quite a journey. And um, especially when you've got no money and no investors and nothing but your mind, that's all you're doing. But we <laughs> were trying our best to work it out. This picture here, 2018 again, I think, we were talking about accounting double entry accounting, and we were completely perplexed. <laughs> Able to solve ridiculously hard problems, but then how do, you, how do these like chart of accounts and stuff work, and all that sort of stuff. That level of growth and maturity that's needed there was like very different, but we were motivated to get something done, at least I was especially as well. We all had that dream. It got really tricky with the COVID pandemic. But we really powered through. Um, this picture here was just after, I think, 2019-ish, 2020, 2020 actually, early 2020. Um, and this one over here on the background, this person there, that's our research school director from the Research School of Physics. His name is Tim Sendon. He is amazing. Um, he let us squat in the Research School of Physics as a little company that does nothing, <laughs> but trying to, with this idea and this dream of how can we apply physics to a real world problem, solve real world problems. And Tim himself has also gone through a journey of founding a company and selling it as well. There is a, a culture there that's within the research school that is really, really excellent. And um, when we were like just founding this this company back then, we always had this idea of like having this space of all of these startups, like what we're doing. It turned out that like Thorm, our company, we were the first all student spin out out of the research school of physics in its history. It took 50 years of its history before we were the first ones there. And I think there was a key aspect to it that we really believed in science and research translation. That was something that really resonated, I think, with Tim, and I think is very important for the Australian ecosystem in science overall. We always stay true to our science. We don't like just sell out in other ways. And that was the one thing that we held on as our real unique value proposition using innovation terms. This was our first office in the basement. It was fun, it was great. A bit of a mess, it was awesome. Then um, we got a slightly better one, but smaller one with more light, which is great. Um, but then the COVID pandemic happened very shortly after, which really sucked. You know, at the end of that, still won another gov hack, which was fun. <laughs> that was the last gov hack we had. But really, we wanted to then focus on sort of trying to move what we kind of worked with to see if it could actually be something that brings recurring value, because consulting to begin with. 
consulting because it's uh, an easy way to get paid. That's one. It's also an easy way to test what do people want. I should actually mention, I forgot to mention, the one thing that we really actually leveraged around this time was the fact that artificial intelligence was kind of becoming more easy to use. It was an emerging field in science. I saw it as an emerging field of science. So for me, going from spending my time from physics and I was doing my PhD to just like, I'm gonna move all my effort over here, was obvious. It is the frontier of science at that time. And that's where I want to be. Um, I, I've since dropped my PhD, but it was nice actually once getting introduced by Tim, the research school director, to somebody um, that said, then no, haven't got their PhDs yet, but that's okay, they don't need it. Which is really nice to hear. I'm going to skip over these very quickly, but as you can see, 2017. This was that first one, that transport optimizer, with um, that we had that explosion of our brains on this whiteboard. Um, it was, that was such a fun, fun weekend because um, whoop, that was a fun weekend because midway through that sort of hackathon, like I had to like run to the theater and watch a, a play that I really wanted to see. I think it was um, 1984, and then run back but still be able to get it off and like give a presentation live. But it was really, it, there's, there's a pattern here. There's a, there's a pattern, I can tell you this pattern, and you can apply your mind to it and your food's mind to it, engineering mind. I like to say that we're like STEMinists or a STEM shop. We have to use the, we have to be multidisciplinary. And it's just like, can we just make a transport network better if we could? And sure, visualize, model, and optimize. So I hope that sounds familiar a bit to you if you're going into a lab and you're doing some science. Let's just take some measurements, visualize those measurements, maybe try to see if it fits some theory, and then maybe see if we can do better. It's the same thing, it's a scientific method. So then we had this sort of like, it's funny, I'm gonna show you these really quickly and then I'm gonna show you another one straight after this and how it looks exactly the same. <laughs> and that's the reason why I included these here. So we then did some like analysis and stuff like that. That was a video, but I went play it, but basically things move around and little dots move around and this and that, and people were blown away. How can they actually like make these visualizations and do this stuff? And I say, ah, there's a huge gap here. I'm gonna move those, and then I wanna go to eSight. So this was another one. Power systems is another thing that they wanted to look at, see, think, do same sort of thing. <laughs> Just visualize, have a look at your data and what it's going to be like, and then what can you do? What can you do with that? And that's experimental sort of physics and science 101, right? And here we go. Optimize makes the best of what you need. <laughs> Saves you money, etc. Surprising. It is surprising genuinely how applicable the just this same process that we learn and do all the time in science and physics is everywhere. In fact, it has really surprised me, especially early on, how many physicists that we met when we were talking to people in industry with our early clients. There are so many physicists and geophysicists in all of these companies in places. It's, it's really, really interesting. They're not necessarily doing fundamental research like they were before, but it's definitely, you speak to them and they're like, oh yeah, we get it. And that's exactly the value that I need to get by studying this. So, then there's another one, physio Rom. Now, this actually turned out to be our first major contract, which was very, very exciting. And that person on the far left there, um, that woman is Sylvia Pfeiffer. Sylvia Pfeiffer is the CEO of CoView. Um, CoView is now very, very big. They were our earliest mentor. Um, we're really, really grateful to have been able to work with her when CoView was a team of two. When COVID hit, their company's like um, utilization of their platform, which is a telehealth platform, it skyrocketed. It went up by 15,000% in two weeks. 15,000% utilization in two weeks. And they just exploded. It, so PhysioBrom was an idea that they had, um, Sylvia had. Again, it was another hackathon. Um, and again, like we were PhD students looking for something to do. And they proposed, can we measure the range of motion over a webcam? So we've got a telehealth platform, and range of motion is just how much you can move a particular joint. And this is applicable if you have a total knee replacement, 
And then what's actually required after that is that it's measured that you can move your knee two degrees every week. Otherwise, you go back to surgery to make sure that it's not seized up. And that will use up a hospital bed. It's also very hard to move people um, when you have a knee replacement. So wouldn't it be great if you could do it over the internet? And it's also a, a hard problem because we only have a webcam, not some fancy like experimental setup like you might in science. And this is something I really enjoy, that challenge. It's, it's actually just too easy to do science and measurements when you've got a bit of money. It's um, in a giant lab. This is wrong. This stuff here actually is what we made in one day. In fact, on the bus trip up to Sydney, where the hackathon was, um, Marsen here ran the code on their laptop and it's like, oh cool, it works, yep, and now we can do that. And uh, there's some great pictures of us like working on this at the beginning. And Sylvia was like, okay, then how do you measure the, now you've got like these these key points, what this this particular AI sort of computer vision problem is called pose detection, it's drawing a skeleton. Um, now you've got these key points, how do you measure the angle between these things? That, it was surprising, <laughs> it was surprising that this is the thing that was blocking all of that, where they just, it's the tan of those sorts of things, and then you've got the number of the answer. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's that's what was needed. So it, it, it's funny. There's the once you it kind of just shows we. I've always believed in utilizing, really believe in moving into the space so much. We believe in that because we really believe in our vision statement for our company, which is to make the ethical decision the economic one. And with things like AI. In computer vision, like being able to draw a skeleton like this relatively accurately over a webcam in real time is only possible because of the advances in AI. This was ages ago now. This was like what, 20, this was 2017. So it's crazy how much things progressed so far. But the fact that it took us to be able to draw this skeleton first, and then the question was, how do you measure the angle and the hand? It needed AI first. And that's where I like to say it creates an arbitrage of what is unlocking of human value for the amount of cost of those. And I think that that sort of ability to be able to see that, that thing that we have, is something that I would say is not really something that's taught in physics and science, which is quite sad. But I think that's probably, I hope that changes one day. It's something that I was taught with, from my dad when he taught me science. I guess, because he was brought up in Pakistan when he did his physics over there. It's a very different story, I think. Um, he did very well, and he told me a story, actually, when he was doing his master's, studying for our second master's, um, and he was going to move into particle physics, and it was back in the days where it was brand new. And he saw a gardener just walking in and through his window while he was studying and just eating a loaf of bread from... And then you realize, how is what I'm going to do any help them at all? And that's something where we are so privileged here in this country, in Australia, almost too privileged, I believe, but that we forget that we, as physicists and scientists, all together, we can provide value to humans immediately. So I really personally believe in the village scientists. That's something that I always believe in. I think it's really important. And having that buying set of a village scientist apparently makes you a very good business person. <laughs> I'm going to skip over that video, but basically I did a pitch and we did a live demo, and then we won again, and that was awesome. I hope this part is over. Oh, no, I got a cute video there. That's funny. Um, Physio Rom actually turned out to get a giant grant from Bacoview. Um, we continued the project. We then, it's also now going through clinical validation. It is the world's first artificial intelligence model to go through clinical validation to be used as an AI assisted tool for this sort of work. And um, I would say it's actually something that really allowed Sylvia, when they were just a team of two, they were walking around with this code that we made on that weekend, running off my computer at home showing it to venture capitalists, and it really helped them lock their first sort of rounds. So it's pretty amazing and humbling to 
just be able to be part of that. And all it took was just to be a bit brave in some ways, or just to try to go out there. Culture Fluent is another one. I'm going to move a bit faster over this, but basically this one is very simple. It's, as you can see, same pattern. Identify what's needed, identify a problem, install. But this is where we actually then apply to uh, like my old IT knowledge and everything, and just put everything together. The important thing is to be able to like work out on how things can fit together very, very quickly, and then to be able to communicate it. I think there's one aspect about all of these, and this is all really pre before we've actually even like, put together our business properly, um, is that having a human-centric approach to these things, but being able to treat yourselves as problem solvers, as being able to see the variables of everything is what's most important. Technology is just a tool for us. So yeah, that was that. Um, that was the early days, I guess, of home. That was the talk that I gave, what, in 2020? Mm -hmm. That would have been from 2017 to 2020. So now I'll give, I guess, a bit from then. Obviously, there was the pandemic, which was very, very hard. And I think I've definitely grown to change as a person. And I think that that has come from the confidence that's been gained from, I guess, being able to do what we're doing. And there is some, it's been a very tough year. I will not lie, it definitely has been tough. But it is overall definitely worth it. And it is continuing to be worth it. Really getting to a point that I just am absolutely in a huge state of gratitude all the time now. We've definitely grown up. So you can see the maturity of things, I guess, are, is a lot more there. Like this is how we then start to present ourselves all the time. And we outbid companies that are much, much bigger than us. And, but really at its heart, it's the same thing like that. That's about it. It's the same thing of applying science. It's the same thing, just that process. It's incredible that, um, how this sort of research and scientific understanding and physics rebuilt everything. Can I play this video? I really want to play this video. Okay, how do I move this up? Sorry, you've got the on the screen there. That's okay. Um, it's not working there, but I can get it on the screen from this yep, website. And then we can move it over. Great. Let's move it up. She just, so essentially how it works is it's just like a second screen that oh, you yeah. drag things cool, onto cool. and then you can control everything on the screen. So I'll let you take cool, it. Cool. So this video is what I was going to play for you. I hope there's audio. I haven't tested that, sorry. Covering over 70% of the planet, our oceans provide us with food, transport, resources, and energy. But human activity at sea is increasing underwater noise pollution, which can harm marine life. Whales are particularly vulnerable. And that's where we come in. WhalePod is an AI-powered whale detection platform that uses state-of-the-art camera arrays to monitor and report nearby activity. WhalePod provides a full 360-degree view in just four seconds and it can detect whales up to five kilometers away. As it detects the warmth of mammals when they breathe, it works in any weather conditions, day and night. With real-time notifications of whale sightings, human-in-the-loop workflow, and an intuitive user interface, WhalePod is a turnkey solution to proactive protection of whales, enabling further industrial maritime growth while protecting our valuable marine life. WhalePod, we're looking out for whales. So when I watch that, I can't believe that it's our company and us that is that did that, that is responsible for this in any way. It's just mind blowing to me. That was very recent, actually. I'll talk a lot more about whale, but you can look at our website if you want to. Um, how do I move now this back? Here we are. Go. Cool. Nope. I was trying to navigate you to the link. Yeah. 
So, that picture and that video there. Um, so, I was very... This has actually jumped right ahead. I'm kind of skipping 2022, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, This is actually very late. This was April. So, this here was now... Instead of like presenting at hackathons, I was presenting at CSIRO on Accelerate 7. So CSIRO on Accelerate 7 is the premier deep tech startup accelerator. And we were very lucky to be able to get in and be able to present our work well by the time. And I think that it was a real turning point now. Actually, we really only just happened this year for our company. Before this year, we were a team of six. Now we're 16. And it took 14 weeks to accelerate on. <laughs> what I would like to say about whale pod and being a back of it to science is the problem itself is very, very hard. A whale, what we're doing is that it surfaces and it surfacing at um, events only about four seconds long. So you have four seconds to be able to see a whale appearing, which is very, very hard, in a very empty ocean. And we want to detect it five kilometers away and in pitch darkness. So to be able to solve that problem, I needed to make a detector. That's just like a physics problem, making a very, very good detector. Um, the sort of cameras and computer vision that exist just wouldn't work. Um, engineers will tell you, you can't put those things together, that won't work. But I did the physics and I made some adjustments and it worked, of course, it was the physics. So we've actually made the most powerful computer vision platform for this now. So it's applicable not just for whales, but everything else. And that's something that was very exciting. So we got to be able to do this project by, we were very lucky to win a $100,000 feasibility study just before COVID hit. And that's how we survived COVID. So we're able to do that work. And it was just after, I think. Then after that, we did so well in the feasibility study that we won $1 million to build the proof of concept, which has gotten to us where we are here. So I think it's really very, very, it's, 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 it's a lot of experience doing this now, I'm talking about this now. It's very hard because honestly, this is so recent for me and it was a moment where I was just like, I was just working so hard and all I cared about was, oh my God, I'm the only person on this project that was given, here, yeah, they gave us a million dollars from the government that said, here's a million dollars, make it, make that product that you pitch because they actually, they had the same thing, like a hackathon. That's why we wanted it in the first place. They came with a problem and we proposed the solution. And our solution and that competitive thing, we, we won that. And we were able to beat everyone else. And we were a team of four at the start there. Um, and a million dollars, they say, here it is, make that thing. But the important thing is that you have to make it a commercial product. You have to make it as a business. It was a grant from the Department of Industry, a bit of business. Um, so it really was an opportunity I didn't want to waste. So it took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get there. But it's really nice to get through it. So nowadays, I actually just don't really bother doing any work for less than $100,000 sort of contracts. Um, going from the difference of just a couple of years ago to now, I would not even bother. I wouldn't even think for me personally at all. And that's something that's kind of wild to me as well. And it's really like, yes, there's pretty now there as well. We are working still ridiculously hard. In fact, anything we're working hard on harder, but we know that we're so close and we're getting, we're at that dream of ours because that company. I'd say that we're really there in many ways. That picture there um, with the whale pod shirt, that's Ellen. Um, I was doing my PhD with Ellen as well in nuclear physics. Um, she was gonna be our first hire, but then it didn't work out. This is a proud moment for me. I wanted to include this photo um, because at on Accelerate, I won. Sure. Yep. Um, I was able to win the CSIRO on Accelerate Stanford Australia Foundation scholarship for being the um, highest performing startup at this particular accelerator. So I was going up against some significantly things, but it's powerful for me to be able to get the Stanford. 
getting a scholarship at Stanford. I've never had a scholarship before in my life. And I'll say that I actually I had an ATAR of 60 is what I got. And I was able to get to here. And I still have 34 research papers as well in nuclear physics. And now it's nice to be able to move there. I put this black slide here for the reason why I really slowed down to a different point was because um, the reality is the first staff member that we that we hired um, that really helped us with all this work, the Dulles Heroes. They passed away tragically just last year, very young. And it was a moment where I, as a, we were as a company, we were the first people to know as founders. Nobody else would have known, knew faster than us. And it was in our hands and our responsibility. Um, but that really, really, it changes a lot of things. It always is like, you get to a point of there's so much work that you can achieve yourself, but then there's the work that you achieve with the team and making the team. And that's really what I'm most proud of what we do now. And so I'm really excited about all of these amazing things and, and like opportunities that I can provide for helping with other people. I love this picture here because that there on, on the right is a venture capitalist. And um, I think Prithvi, when they first met them, sent them a book on post-capitalism. <laughs> and it's been an exciting journey. For me, I include two more other pictures. Ah, where is this? Two other pictures, yeah. I didn't know what the word non-binary was until I turned 30, which was after I found this company. And that's something that's really important to me as well. On the left there, that was the first time I represented form and address. And I did it at the accelerator because that's what I believe that we need to do. We really need to have that. And the concept, I guess, of what it is, is of leadership in science as well as for people, and what that actually can mean and what you can achieve is really what it means to me nowadays. Um, so now we have three offices here in physics in Canberra, and we have staff all across the East Coast. We have a plant consultant, which is awesome as well. So nice to have that. And amazing staff. I am really quite excited about what we can do in the future. Not just with Grail Hopper, but all of our other projects. And for us, it's always been about being able to create a space for people who are great to be able to do great things. It's really that simple. And actually just follow your excitement, which is what I did when I went from IT to physics. That was it. I love this photo because this went around the teams as like a meme where it's like, this is our two co-founders, two founders, right? Looking at a staff member and it's like, the look that you get when you're just about to get fired or something like that. <laughs> so we also have a lab, which is amazing and fun as well. And just want to kind of leave it at the fact that when you bring a group of great people together that are multidisciplinary, in fact, in this photo, they have a chiropractor and a chemist and people in biology and everything, and engineers, but we are able to talk in the same same sort of language. Um, yeah, so with that, I guess I will close on up. Thanks. So thanks Akil so much for your time to uh, present to everyone. Do you have time to take questions or do you have I to do. go? I do, I do. I have a dance class that I need to get to. I promised myself I'll finish it for one time. <laughs> no. <laughs> cool. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask the kid about what they've done and how they got to where they are? Or about physics? You can ask me anything about physics, and they know quite a bit about stuff. Yeah. Um, how did you apply physics to um, solve natural vision problems for the world? Great question. So, we first of all wanted to choose how can we, what sort of spectrum. It's a simple problem of detection now, is what I reduced it to. So what signals can I gain from a whale? And especially ones that you can see at night. Obviously, thermal comes into mind, right? So the, the long wave sort of thermal spectrum, or there's mid-wave thermal spectrum. So one of the works that actually Matt did that um, when he passed away for whale pod was he made a he adapted a simulator called Blender that's used to make animations, um, and change the lighting source to include thermal lighting sources and spectral lighting sources, as well as put a model inside of this for it to include like the fog in the way, 
and we just used that to be able to make a radiant whale that was floating above an ocean in IR and simulate it so that we can see that indeed this is the amount of detection capability we could get. <laughs> so that was one choice was that, like which one do we want to use, mid-wave IR or long-wave IR? That took a lot of decision making as well. Um, one, you would use it's a photon detector, there's another detector and different characteristics. The black body radiation spectrum is different. Long wave IR works better and peaks with its black body radiation spectrum for stuff that is like our temperature, which whales are warm. We detect the warm breath of a whale and hence a cold ocean. That is the hypothesis and that's what we tested. Um, then for whale pod to take it to the next level, we extended it even further and I actually decided, can I make my dream platform and actually get color and thermal at the same time down the same beam path, which is some crazy optics. Do we have any other, I, I, I like, would it be like the whole idea of do this and see if that issues in some kind of is that kind of Basically. Now we're going to the point where we are, we've written down what companies we want to work with a list of 100 companies we want to work with, and then we go out and we vet them and decide whether we want to make a project to work with them um, to solve what their problems are. We get a value alignment. Um, because really, we have power as scientists and physicists of what we get to do. Right? Yeah. Choosing what problems we want to solve is now where we're at. That was a good place to get there. So Graham's had a slightly different path to a keel in terms of, uh, I guess, what he's done with his physics. So um, I'd say that you've taken a more kind of traditional academic type route. Would you say that's fair to say, Graham? Or? Yeah, probably. Yeah. So um, yeah, whereas I'd say that yours is a bit of a more non-traditional part of the keel. If you are a yeah. we do a lot of deep points. But there is the pathways to go where you want to go. And I'm sure Greg uh, speaking can account for this. Well, there are a hundred ways to get where you want to go. I have a daughter. She's 90 years old, turns out yesterday. And um, she doesn't really like to go to college. She uh, does her thing. She had, didn't really have good grades, but now. Uh, so she's floating around, working a little bit, but now she starts thinking again to, uh, you know, maybe go to TAFE, to do a degree, or to get a diploma, and keep going and maybe start university. And my son also, he was not very happy with school, and now he has an IT job in uh, ACT Shared Services, and he makes a packet, and he just bought his own house. And he was actually the problem child. <laughs> So, you know, there's hundreds of ways to getting where you want to go. The key is, if you are interested in what you are doing and you try to pursue what it is, there's always someone around who can help you to get there. Uh, I had various uh, uh, professors and um, teachers who said, yep, yeah, I will help you out. And, you know, I did the lead work. But then they helped me translate in English because, okay, can I just keep going? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so I guess I did a small introduction already. This is Graham. He's been, I guess, a little bit of a role model for me for a long time. Um, and so I really appreciate him taking time. He's a very busy person. Uh, as you're about to find out, he works with gravitational waves and the work that his group has done has been very successful. Um, just out of interest, hands up if you've heard of gravitational wave detections before. So about half the class. Okay, so, yep, just so, yep. And I'll just pass straight over to you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I'm a, an, a, an academic here at ANU and a research scientist doing instrument, instrumentation for gravitational wave detection. And here I actually, what I did, I thought I heard, you know, path where you're going. So I just wrote down sort of where I came from, what happened, and there's actually a few more steps in there. But I actually came from the Netherlands. So my English was not very good. I maybe saw some spelling mistakes in there anyway. So actually, when I went to, to Australia, because I in the previous century, uh, my friends actually laughed at me because my English was really bad. I, I, I had very challenging, even though I didn't went that way. That in my English, I have English lessons. I had to do presentations like some of what I'm doing now. And I was starting to start speaking English, and within the first two minutes, the teacher said, "Well, from 
maybe we should do a rain check and uh, and check out what you're going to do next. Huh? Then I went to Australia, did a, a, my uh, uh, internship here at ANU XD as well, and then I came back. And then, of course, my English was is, is quite well, so I presented. And then he, his comment was, hmm, there's a very strong Australian accent, <laughs> which was true. Anyway, so I actually so I went in the Netherlands, graduated. I reached out to, uh, I actually sent 16 packet of information about myself to various companies. I wanted to do outside the Netherlands, to America, to Germany, to Greece, to Australia, to the ANU over here. And in the end, only Australia came back. And just before I left to Australia, two weeks before it, I got an email from an institute in Greece saying, oh, we would love to come you to Greece. And I said, what, Greece is Europe? I'm going to Australia. So, you know, so I went to Australia, did my internship over here. I went back, then I graduated. And that was another stint in Germany, uh, what I did. Uh, and then I reached out to the professor over here saying, hey, can I do a PhD? And he said, yeah, sure, but we can't, you know, support you with anything. So here, yeah, apply to this. So I applied, got a fellowship for a student uh, uh, scholarship, started to do PhD, PhD. So again, as I said before, I just reached out to other people what I wanted to do. And uh, I started my PhD many years later, graduated, went to UWA to another place in Perth with people. Are you all from Canberra or are they all over the place? Everybody's from Canberra. Excellent. Or so Perth is, is, if you know, Australia. <laughs> anyway. So Perth, very far away, there was another uh, people we uh, collaborated with. So I went over there to the, the, the lab and uh, set up a big experiment, which was super exciting. Then uh, money dried out because I was, uh, at the time, and I uh, was always running on grants. So my little boss, he wrote to uh, grants to get money. And then that, that money was, he got that, and then he, he, he gave me a salary to do my, uh, my work. Uh, then at that period in around 2006, there was no money, nowhere, so I was actually uh, uh, unemployed, although I still worked, well, worked. I volunteered, I guess, for my boss uh, here, saying still in the lab, helping out students and, and postdoc to do work, but I didn't actually get paid. And then I got an, a, a very prestigious fellowship uh, in, in, in Australia, so together we applied for a grant, so then I got set, uh, a salary. And from there, actually, it's kind of all over the place. And bottom line, now I'm an academic. Uh, actually, this year, uh, a full-time academic at the plane. So, uh, there's a little bit of me. If you have any questions on that, just raise your hands or yell out, and we can just go over there. So, um, here at ANU, what we're doing, we're building instrumentation, and we'll go over that later a little bit, what it actually means to help detect gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are, uh, are changing the time space, time and space, um, and, and we try to detect that and we'll go also there what that actually means later on. Uh, so this is a pretty picture that we have down in the lab. There's another little pretty picture. This is actually what I've been building uh, downstairs. This is a pet project of mine with uh, students and postdocs. And so what you do, you come up with a concept you think about how to work, and then you do lots of drawings. You go to a workshop and saying, hey, we've, uh, where is it? Over there, there's a mechanical workshop. You have three people sitting in there. They're excellent machinists. You ask them to do something. You draw on a piece of paper, a round circle and a hole, and then you know, two weeks later, they get this, well, whatever it is, what you need. And it's like, yes, it's exactly what I wanted. Uh, so they're super skilled in doing that, and they're doing that for many years. So. When we're working here in this lab, we're using a lot of people with ex uh, skills. It's, you know, they're not the scientists, but they are the technical machine shop people. And if we don't have them, I would not be able to do any of the work we're doing. So those people are critical in what we're doing. Um, so, gravitational waves. Uh, this is, uh, the story is a little bit backwards. We're going through little pretty pictures, and then we're going to the, the, the instrument itself. So um, in uh, what is it, uh, 2015, we detected gravitational waves and discovered. So Einstein had this theory uh, that says that oh, you know, if masses accelerate, then they uh, accelerate, then they emit gravitational waves. A lot of people started thinking, oh, is that really true? How does it work? And then there was a guy who said, oh, well, if you have two masses, you continuously monitor the uh, uh, position 
with respect to each other. And if there's a gravitational wave coming through, then the relative distance between those two masses will change. And actually, that happens to the whole Earth. So if there's a that gravitational wave coming through, the Earth, if it's a nice spherical ball, suddenly becomes an egg in one direction, and then appears later in an egg in another direction, and that keeps oscillating in egg shapes uh, back and forth. And that is what we try to measure. Uh, we try to measure that with two masses they're floating almost in space and we continuously monitor the distance between the two and if there's a gravitational wave coming through then the relative distance between the two masses change and it's actually what we're doing we're timing the light leaving for one mass go to the other, other mass and reflect back reflect to the first mass and we time it with a stopwatch it's not quite a stopwatch it's a clock and then we measure that the uh, uh, light travels at a different speed so then we can say that it's actually a relative displacement so we detected about 100 of those event, events. Initially, people didn't actually, they, they believed they were there, but we never really seen them. And then in, finally, in uh, 2015, we did discover that. And then it took us six months, six months to work out that it was real. We were absolutely convinced that it was real, but we wanted to make sure in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the world that it was true, because in the 60s, there was uh, a person called Weber, he built a big bar, like, you know, literally a bar like this, or this aluminium. And uh, the idea there is as well that if there is a gravitational wave coming through, that bar will basically get longer and shorter, longer and shorter. And he tries to measure the length of the bar, and he actually saw something. So everyone thought, oh, hang on, I'm going to do that too. So it was in Perth, there's not a person, they build a big bar, and they call called bar resonators bar detectors to try to detect gravitational wave. What we actually think what happens is that he measured some internal modes, about thermal noise modes in that bar. But who knows, because he was always convinced that it was there, but no one could verify it. He never saw it himself. So it was a little bit of a, not quite sure it was really true. So when we saw this, so the top trace, the red one and the, uh, uh, the, the, the right one, the blue one, that's the, almost the raw data, data we saw. And what we do, then we have this other wiggle that we have a match filter. So we actually know how the wiggle looks like. And we match the wiggle what we look like to what we measure. And then the parameters to make, you know, the mass, the distance, the size, etc. of that wiggle, we then know what, what the uh, um, gravitational wave looks like. So that's real data. So it's actually amazing that you can see that. Um, and then uh, the bottom trace is then basically uh, how it looks like. So this sort of picture is you have two masses, you know, and they're a neutron star. What is a neutron? People know what a neutron star is? Well, what do they call it a neutron star. So a neutron star that is um, the size of Canberra, but then the mass of about 1.4 solar mass in that size. Uh, they, 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 that, that's, that's the general size. Then we have two of those, they're rotating around, and then the first phase you have just the normal oscillations on that side. And then they're getting closer and closer and they're losing energy, and they're losing energy, part of that energy is in gravitational waves. Okay? And then suddenly when they start, and then when they're further and further accelerating, suddenly there's so much energy, and it's just before then a collide, there's so much energy emitting that we can detect that and then it merges and then becomes one object and then it rings down afterwards a little bit and we can't see that because we're not sensitive enough. If we can see that then we can see some other exciting um, physics. But these I think is an animation. No it's not an animation. It be an animation. So this is what they think it looked like, this is an animation of the first detection we saw. So there's two black holes, one 26 and one uh, 30 or thereabouts. They're circling around and this for the last couple of seconds that the two black hole merges. And you can see it get closer and closer and then it goes faster and faster so that gets that oscillation happening and then there is this merger. And then it rings down afterwards a little bit but we can't really see that. Bringing after it, but that's a simulation made by uh, someone else from the first detections. So, the means we detect that, I said before that we see these uh, masses oscillating. So, what we do, 
having a ring of particles, and that's what Einstein sort of came along with. You have a ring of particles, and there's gravitational waves coming through, and that ring of particles change in oscillation, as you see there. So now if we have an, uh, an, um, an infrauder, I'm maybe going a little bit fast, but, um, and you can see you have uh, the mirrors. I don't have a point. I do have a point. I do have a point. So you have them. I don't have a point. Do I have a point? Uh, scroll to the right hand side of the screen, the top right hand side. Uh -huh. So these are those green things that are particles again. Okay, and then we have a big laser and we shoot it around and we're continuously measuring the relative position of those and mirrors. Okay, and then you can see if it goes one, say, the same as that oscillation we had before. Then we can see, uh, and we can follow through the change in oscillation of the mirrors. Okay, and with that, and then you get photo. Uh, in the bottom end, you can then see the detection. And then here is another little animation. So this is actually how. Oh, there it is. Sorry. So the cylinder is the laser. It comes through, and there's that oscillation happening. And on the white plate at the bottom right, that is where we then see better oscillation as a detector. It is the light travels through in one direction. Yeah perpendicular to each other and it comes back reflects at the end convex and then in the center here the corner there's an interference happening okay and as light um, they combine to make the light brighter or if they destructive then the light gets uh, uh, dissipated because it goes to the laser and then we can measure that and then any changes at the end we can record it very accurately here at the detector at the end It's called a Michelson interferometer. Right. Um, this is the large scale. Okay, so this is so this is sort of what uh, goes through. Yes. So what actually happens? We have two masses. They have a solar uh, neutron stars together. They have about radius of twenty kilometers. About Canberra. They're sitting at a distance of, you know, ten to a lot of kilometers apart. Now the changes that we measure of those two masses separating from each other is that random number, ten to minus nineteen meters. That is like ten thousand times smaller than the diameter of a proton. Does people know what the diameter of a proton is? Do you know what your diameter of your hair is? Sorry. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> so one person. Do you know what the diameter of your hair is? It's about 100 microns. Okay, that is 10 to minus 6. So now I want to go a little bit smaller. Well, we can go a little bit smaller. What is smaller than your diameter of your hair? Or we can go to your proton, but it's a really big step. <laughs> <laughs> I want to try to work out that you follow me in the size. Of things that was a it's a beautiful YouTube video actually you should watch I thought I'd find that as well it goes in in, in um, inside anyway so if you have the diameter so you have um, diameter of a proton is ten to the minus fifteen uh, you have a picometer oh someone someone so this is the atom sorry yeah that's the atom I'm, ten to the minus ten yeah ten to the minus ten but you know what an atom is I don't know what an atom is well I know what an atom <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ten to the minus ten. That's right. And then a single, you know, and then you have your molecules, or the atom, and then you have the particles in the atom, and then your proton. So that goes to ten to the minus fifteen. And then we actually thousand times smaller than that that we're trying to measure on Earth. It's a crazy number. I don't even know what the number is. I know the number is ten to the minus nineteen. That's only about how small it is. I, I work every day with that number, but I still conceptually have no idea what it really is. It's, 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 it's weird. Um, but that's what we try to detect on Earth. Okay. So if you have your rulers, 
Well, you have your ruler to have like 30 centimeters and they have your millimeters. Excellent. So what is the smallest piece you can measure on that thing? Um, yeah, it's a millimeter, so the accuracy would be half a millimeter, right? And a millimeter is about 10 to minus 3. And here we're going 10 to minus 19. Okay, and your hair is about 10 to minus 4. So yeah, it's cra crazy numbers. So, um, the way we do that, uh, have built, built uh, gravitational wave detectors in the US. There's two detectors, one in Hanford and one in Livingston. And they look about this. So you have a corner building, there's that beam splitter you saw before. And then you have four kilometers long tubes. So then that end mirror is about four kilometers away. And you had another one in another state. And then here, so when they got built in 1995, uh, 96, they started building that. So it has this steel tube, it's about 1.2 meters in diameter, and it's about four kilometers long, okay? And because in the US, all sorts of things happened, people have guns and people have cars, so that beam tube is evacuated, so all the air is sucked out of it, it pumps, so there's no air in there. And why don't we want air? Because we don't want the turbulence, you know. Remember in summer when you're driving on the road and then in the far distance you see the you know the, the shimmering going from the asphalt. That is the turbulence you're gonna see. We don't want that because it also if the laser beam goes through that, then that gets that same turbulence that we don't want. So we're evacuating all the air. So that's why we have these steel tubes that we're evacuating it. Um, of those those steel tubes are about five, six millimeters in diameter, uh, thickness of steel. And uh, because in the US, as you can see, you're driving around, there was, a, there was a road there originally, and it was four kilometers, it was blocked off. So that sheriff was driving away at night, and then he just drove into it. So we have a double reinforced concrete going over it. It's actually in Louisiana, in the southern state of the US, there's actually lots of bullet holes on the concrete because people just like tiger chewing or something. I don't know. So, if we didn't have that, then that steel would be totally uh, broken to pieces and then the whole experiment would fall apart. So at the time, people said, oh, why do you need reinforced concrete? It turns out you need it for that. So in the center of those, that hole, there's those large vacuum tanks. And that is equipment they've done in the lab as well. So if I would stand next to that, I would, my head will be uh, my head will be sort of sitting around that level. Okay, so let's use those things. Um, what is inside there? So I've been on site, I've been working on it. Actually, that thing on the bottom right, that's the device I actually built on site. And it's hanging there, lovely. So in there, we're trying to do very precise uh, measurements. So we need to build that. Again, the workshop down here actually made pieces. Not, not that one, which is actually installed in there. So what I did, we designed those pieces here at ANU, liaised with the people in the US, traveled to the US, talked to them, then designed it here, the workshop, make 30 of those devices, we bring them to the US and install them. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're just doing lots of installation. So that over here, which you almost can't see, this, <laughs> Not that, this tiny thing, that's what I, I built and I designed here at ANU and we installed that over there. It is very proud uh, achievement because that piece of equipment actually also directed the, gra the signal which has the gravitational wave on, it, on the detectors. So um, uh, my, my device that I built was actually seeing gravity waves. Um, so yeah, so that's that's what I did here in the, in the, in the years uh, uh, leading up to 2011, 28, 2008, sorry. We're building that and we're engaged with, uh, with these things. So the bottom right, oh, so top right, sorry. So this is one of the test masses that I was talking about. You know, those big mirrors, very pure. They're about uh, 40 kilograms each. They are uh, pure fused silica, about uh, 30 centimeters in diameter. 20 centimeters thick, and they hang from uh, a pendulum. Does anyone know what a pendulum is? I'm not sure you do, but I'm just. What is a pendulum? That's just a thing 
a mass meeting. Oh, why? Excellent. Yes, that is what it is. And the thing is, so we don't, except we don't have just one wire, we actually have four of those. We have a wire, a mass, a wire, a mass, a wire, a mass, a wire, a mass. And the bottom mass is that bottom thing. And why do we want to do that? Because the ground motion, the ground moves around the place. If you're standing here, this ground probably moves about 5 micrometers, 10 to minus 6. It just vibrates around. Remember that we want to detect that 10 to the minus 19. Okay, so we're setting that mirror just on the ground, it moves by 10 to the minus 6. So we need to isolate it. One way of doing that is using those pendants. Because if we suspend it, then that isolate uh, or vibration isolate from the ground to the test mass. And um, and that yeah, those things are about two meters tall and they make lots of uh, very precise pendulous and the whole thing as you can see here we have there's a four stage there's a three stage there's another three stage that sending is a two stage and that's also a three stage so we have all sorts of stages of pentameus um, if even the pendulum was sort of some amount of physical complex would a magnetically levitated um, thing be better theoretically the idea is great However, when we try it, the noise coupling from the current or whatnot, you need to generate that magnet in the still coupling. Also, when you have a magnetic force, you actually have a damping term on it. And then the quality factor, so it's, although you make it very pure, you um, uh, uh, negate that purity because you're having this current floating around to generate the magnet. Then you can do superconductive, superconductive magnets, but that is a challenging as well. A colleague of mine in Japan did that and thought it was a brilliant idea and you know, it was not so brilliant because the, also the thing is because it's magnetic the uh, earth magnetic field is around the place that changes around that couples into it and that also generates more noise than that 10 to the minus 9. So the concept yes not actually working that so much unfortunately and then we did not want uh, Caltech to do the same thing because oh we can do better but that worked out not so good either. So yeah fair point. So on that note, yes, we need to hold that pendulum on the ground at some point. That is correct. The thing is that that is okay because the, um, the actual DC motions we're not really interested in. So we're only looking at signals which are slightly higher frequencies. So not that, like uh, the signals at uh, 10 times per second we're interested in or 1,000 times per second. And then if the, 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 the piece of where we, the frame that sits on the ground, we, if that slightly moves around, that is okay because we can negate that because we're controlling it, pushing down to pushing. Uh, oh, yeah, no, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, Brian, can I give you a five minute warning? Yeah, you can definitely five minute warning. Let's, let's, then, um, uh, well, the, 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 yeah, let's leave it at that. <laughs> you have to finish that? Yeah, yeah, I totally have to finish that. All right. Uh, can we just uh, give a round of applause to say thank you? <laughs> and then, uh, we've got a hand up over there. I also just noticed that this graph is the graph of the noise. When you talk to the people at work in, uh, on this, all they want to talk about is what they call the noise. What is causing all the background shaking and how do they cut down on it? So for him to give up speaking at this point, I think is actually quite an achievement. Because normally this is everything that uh, uh, physicists like to talk about. Um, so, yeah, question? Um, how do you account for like the Earth's rotation? Uh, regarding because it's four kilometers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we. We take that into account. So what happens there is that yes, so if you have two two pieces next to each other on the Earth, it's, it's flat. But then if indeed if you move around four kilometers, it's actually the the it pulls pulls that. So actually the mirrors, if we don't correct for, is actually not facing each other. So what we do, we're actually giving a quite tweak forward so that they do face each other. The hardest part is is that there is then the vertical to link coupling. So then if locally you're moving up and down because the ground moves up and down as well by, by a micron or more and because the mirror is tilted you have to be then you know if you're going up and down so the length will changes so yes that is an issue we know that so we can correct that 
but yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge because the next future idea is when you guys are all awesome scientists, so about 2030, yeah, we're building, or we would like to build a 40 kilometer device. So not four kilometers, but 40 kilometers. And that's the future experiment we're trying to do. In and that be, hopefully the 20 kilometer version of that. <laughs> 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 you know, but, but yes, no, no, we're working towards to getting gravitational wave detector in Australia, and you guys are totally needed. So that will be then 20 kilometers, so that will be even worse. But we're taking that into account <laughs> in the control to ne negate that. So, but that's a very valid question, yes. So if you have multiple detectors, and they get the gravitational wave at different times, could you use that to find the location of them? Yes, excellent question. That's totally correct. So that's why in the US you have two, because of the time, it's about 1.3 microsecond difference. And with that, if they uh, are going, like one detector sees first than the other one, we then can work out that it comes from there. Unfortunately, with quadra pulses, that it's not there. There's actually a band where it is. So we actually need a third one to then uh, uh, trojanize to have a, an, another band where that cross section is that it is over there. However, it's also you have one over there as well. So it's actually, but yes, yeah, you need multiple ones to 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 triangulate the position because then we can uh, so the the, the binary neutral star merges. They actually have. Uh, electromagnetic counterparts, so black hole, black hole, you know, we can't see bugger all, okay, if energy merges, but if the neutral star merges, actually electromagnetic radiation, so if we know where it is, then the optical astronomers, they can shoot the telescopes in that direction, and then they can work out um, the luminosity or the decay of that, and that can tell them what sort of event it was, they can do special spectroscopy, so work out where, what uh, materials are generated in there. And there's actually don't work out where the gold comes from because on Earth there's lots of gold. We're trying to work out where it comes from, not so much where it comes from, but how the heavy metals are made. And um, uh, and, and because then we say, oh, maybe we can do it in in the, uh, in the sun and with the clumping of, of the material in the, in the, in the planetary uh, planetary disk scenario, but it's still not enough to actually generate all the heavy metals. Turns out that the merger of neutron stars, there's so much energy there that the heavy metals are generated. So there's another avenue to how we get heavy metals in the universe. So we have Rachel here, who's from Canberra Hospital, and she'll be able to tell you better than I can exactly what she yeah. does. So I might just uh, yeah, leave you to it. Yep. Great. Thanks, Lachlan, and thank you all for coming out on a rainy night. Um, I feel like I've got a hard task to follow up after Bram's talk, because what I do is much less wildly exciting, but I still think it's quite cool. So I am Rachel, I work at Canberra Hospital in radiotherapy, so I'm a radiation oncology medical physicist. And I guess what I'm going to be talking about is what that means, what is radiation therapy, and what is the role of a medical physicist in that domain. Um, start with a little disclaimer. Um, this isn't a controversial presentation at all, but all the things I'm going to be talking about and the views and opinions, they're mine. I'm not wearing the badge of Canberra Health Services tonight. Um, and I'd also like to say a massive thank you to John Lee, who's one of my colleagues. And I've snapped with a lot of the slides tonight, basically straight from him. So um, that saved me a lot of time. But it's the same story that really any radiation oncology medical physicist would give you. So um, radiation therapy is one of the treatment options that cancer patients get. So two of the other classics would be chemotherapy and surgery. What the best pathway for you is as a cancer patient is really a question for the medical specialists. And that's something that you'd be discussing with doctors. But your pathway will start with a consult with your doctor. And if they recommend radiation therapy, that doctor would be a radiation oncologist and they're going to be telling you about what the treatment regime will look like and what the possible benefits and risks are going to be. If you go down that path and you do have radiotherapy, the first sort of medical appointment that you're going to have is a CT simulation. So this um, donut shaped device is a CT machine. Um, it gathers a three-dimensional image of a patient in using x-rays so rather than just a planar x-ray where you get a two-dimensional image like you might if you have a broken arm or leg this one gives you three dimensions 
by acquiring X-rays at lots of different angles. Um, the reason it's called a 3T, sorry, CT <coughs> simulation as opposed to any other type of CT image is we use the images from this appointment to simulate the treatment that the cancer patient's going to get down the track. So usually by the time you've selected radiotherapy to treat your cancer, you've had a lot of imaging already. You might have had MRIs or other CT scans, or PET scans. There's a lot of different imaging that goes on in healthcare generally, but particularly for cancer patients. But the purpose of those images is typically for diagnostics of the disease. So where is the disease? Has it spread? How much has it spread? Whereas the purposes of this appointment for a patient is to simulate the sort of treatment that they're going to get going forward. Um, so, like I said, it's a three-dimensional image that you get. Typically, we look at these images in three orthogonal planes, so you sort of look at slices through the patient, but you can also look at a longitudinal or um, coronal slice. Um, and sometimes we like look at the, the image in the top right there in a three-dimensional, sort of move it around and sort of look at where the anatomy sits. But usually it makes most sense to look in slices. And a typical resolution of these scans would be three millimeter slices. Anatomy doesn't change that much in most of the body. Over a three mil distance, you can always interpolate. But sometimes we might want a really high resolution image and might do one mil slices, particularly if we're looking at little tiny sort of metastases in the brain where it's critical structures and the, the sizes of the, the lesions, the tumors that we want to treat are really tiny. Um, but that's kind of, again, sort of a decision that's up to the doctors is how much resolution do they need for these sorts of images. Um, once you've got these three-dimensional simulation images, the first part of the process is for the doctor to then look at them and what we say contour is essentially draw on the parts of the anatomy that they want to treat. So this is a head and neck scan. The patient's got cancer somewhere in their head and neck and you can see, well, I hope you can see some of the different colours there, would be different regions that the doctor thinks, well, this is a, a primary tumour site that I want to treat, but there's also other parts all the way down the neck that might not actually have disease in them right yet, but they're known to be common pathways for disease, so it makes sense to treat those parts as well, at least a little bit. So you might not be giving the same level of radiation to those areas, but you give enough to limit the disease progression. Again, that's a medical decision, it's not really for the physicist to say, but it's up to us to help get sufficient images and good image quality for the doctors to then make those decisions. And I'll come back and talk a bit more about the, the sort of treatment planning and simulation process as we go. After this image has been acquired, the next kind of um, step on the patient's journey is going to be their first treatment. So usually a cancer treatment using radiotherapy involves multiple visits. So you would come for three or five, 15, maybe up to 30 different appointments. And that's for sort of um, radiobiological reasons. It makes more sense to give the full dose of radiotherapy split up rather than it just in one go. Um, when they come for their treatment, this is the machine that treats them. So obviously at Canberra Hospital, we don't treat dogs. But the machine in the background is called a linear accelerator. We usually say LINAC because they're lazy. And it's exactly the same machine that we use for human patients. So uh, don't, I won't try and use this pointer because I'll stop my slides or something. But the, the big kind of U-shaped um, part of the machine is where the radiation is generated. Most commonly, we're using photon beams, so high energy photons, and I'm going to discuss a little bit about how we generate those. Um, and that whole gantry, it's called the gantry, can rotate around. So it moves in this arc and you can choose which um, directions it points at the patient um, to get your beam coming in through different parts of the anatomy. Uh, the other thing that moves or can move is the couch that the patient's lying on 
can go sort of left, right, in, out, up, down, and it can also rotate on the turntable um, at the bottom. So there's a lot of degrees of freedom in the treatment room to allow you to get your patients set up in exactly the same position at treatment as you had them set up for during the simulation appointment. So remembering that the simulation was there in order to model and to simulate how the treatment would work. So it's very important that you replicate the setup um, in, both, in both scenarios. Um, so let's have a bit more of a look kind of inside the, the gantry and at the, the treatment machine itself and how it generates a beam. Um, this is a schematic of a LINAC. Um, so there's quite a lot of technology in here that we've seen in other parts of everyday life. So if we start um, in, in the top left, the electron gun, um, classically the, the piece of technology that people talk about with electron guns is a cathode ray TV, the cathode ray or CRT TV. We don't really see CRT TVs anymore, but you know about them from the media, from whatever. It's, it's a pretty standard way to use electrons to um, sort of accelerate over short distances. Um, and it's essentially an evacuated tube with a little filament in it that you heat up to get a cloud of electrons. The reason it has to be evacuated is electrons interact with lots of things, so you don't want air molecules breaking up the electron beam and, and sort of interfering with um, what you're trying to generate. Um, that's really just a source of electrons for us. There's nothing, um, nothing important about the electrodes that the, um, are in that tube apart from generating a short little beam of electrons. <coughs> um, then the next thing is um, a microwave generator, or in this case, it's actually a microwave amplifier. It's a klystron. Um, again, microwaves are something we're all familiar with. We've all got a microwave in our kitchens. It's the same frequency or the same frequency band that we're using in these machines. The difference is that it's much more powerful. So we've got orders of magnitude more power in the microwaves that we use in these machines compared to what we'd have in our kitchens at home. Um, but it's the same principle. It's still radio frequency waves or microwaves and they're fed into the waveguide and they're fed in in such a way that there's synchronicity between the, the microwave frequency and the pulses of electrons that we're putting in from the electron gun. And that's important because the point of the waveguide is to accelerate the electrons. So all we've got really is a little beam of electrons. Basically, they, they've got motion, but not very much. And we want to get them up to really high energies at the end of that tube. Um, and the microwaves work a little bit like um, if you imagine having um, any oscillator like a kid on a swing and you're giving them a push, you want to get the push time so that you know, every time the kid's coming towards you, you push at the same point. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to put, transfer power from yourself to that oscillator. Um, it's a similar idea in a waveguide. There are different types of waveguides, but essentially you're transferring energy from a radio frequency wave, so, or from your microwaves, to the electrons. And we're getting up to relativistic speeds. So very quickly you've got um, basically the speed of light in your electrons and then subsequent pushes just give them more energy. So they're, they're really high energy electrons by the time they get to the end of the waveguide, which is typically one to one and a half meters long. Um, <clears throat> so now we've got a really high energy beam of electrons, but it's going horizontal. And remember from before, We've got a patient who's also horizontal. So in order to sort of treat the patient, we're going to need to bend the beam round so that it's going down through the patient anatomy. And that's what the bend magnet is at the end. And again, the point about putting this in the slide is to say, well, magnets we are used all over the place. There's lots of, we, I mean, we've discussed the potential for using magnets to levitate um, mirrors in Brown's experiment. Like there's lots of different uses for magnets. Some of them are obviously in cool science things, some of them seem quite man mundane. Um, the magnets used here are a combination of electromagnets and solid state um, devices. The advantage of electromagnets is you can manipulate them, so if you need to do adjustments and tune things and you want to bend your beam slightly differently one day compared to the next for whatever reason, 
you can tune stuff. Um, the disadvantage is you need to then monitor that and maintain it and make sure it's tuned correctly, um, whereas a, you know, a static piece of equipment that's magnetic is typically much more stable. So there's places for both in this type of um, technology. Um, and then the next stage is kind of, I think, the most physics-y thing that's happening in here. A lot of this is engineering, although there's obviously a crossover. Um, when, well, I'll go back one stage, once it's bent down, um, there's a, a little chunk of typically copper or some other, other um, dense material that, that, that's called a target, which the high energy electrons interact with. So, so far we've just got a high energy electron beam, but what we want is a high energy photon beam. So somehow we need to change the energy from the electrons into photons. And that's done in the target. And so what's basically happening is um, we've got an interaction between the electrons and the Coulomb force from the nucleus of an atom. Remembering that most of an atom is actually empty space, most electrons don't interact in this way. Most electrons really don't see the target atoms at all. Or they interact with other electrons in the target material. So most of the interactions that happen in the target are heat or sort of elastic and inelastic collisions. About 10% of them at these energies will be what's called Bremsstrahlung radiation. And I probably butchered the pronunciation of that, but it basically means breaking radiation in German. Um, and it's a conservation of energy. It's just saying as you change the path of your electron, it's, um, it's got to release energy and that energy has to go somewhere and it is released as a photon. So this is the beam that we then use to treat cancer patients. <coughs> um, once we've got our photon beam, the last stage is really just to collimate it. So to, to provide an aperture of the right shape so that you don't just have a wide photon beam that treats everything you want to get it narrow to the right shape and right size um, to, to treat the anatomy that you're interested in. And we do this using basically lead or tungsten, high dense materials, big thick materials so that you don't just generate another sort of target for Grunstrahlung radiation. Um, and again, these are materials that we see in, in lots of engineering sort of projects, in other contexts where you need that sort of radiation resistant and, t and sort of high thermal conductivity um, so that it doesn't just melt on you when you're using it. And we'll talk more about the collimators as well. So um, that's, that's kind of engineering side to radiotherapy. Um, as a physicist um, in, in the day-to-day -day job, a lot of what we do is maintaining these machines and maintaining the quality assurance of these machines. So, lots of frequent measurements to verify that they're tuned and performing in the way that they should be tuned and performing to, to deliver the beams that we want them to deliver. Um, most of that is proactive. It, it, most of the time things don't go wrong or they've got inbuilt interlocks to detect things when, you know, if they go out of tolerance themselves. But because it's such a sort of um, critical safety component um, in case, you know, in case something did go wrong, it's really important that we do those checks um, to, to find things before they happen. Um, if we move on to what happens within the patient um, when this beam interacts with them, in a really simplistic sense, we can think of this as a, a cross section through, um, let's say, the abdomen of a patient. So the, the pink area is just normal um, tissue. And then somewhere internally, there's some structures that the doctor has drawn onto that 3D data set and said, this is where I want to get a um, some dose, some radiation delivered. If we put just a beam of radiation through, we're going to get dose or exposure throughout the whole tissue and dose will be delivered there. So we talk in radiation therapy, we talk about dose as the amount of radiation that's delivered. 
and the unit of measurement is one gray, and a gray is one joule of energy that's absorbed per unit mass. Um, obviously, this is delivering energy to the internal structure, but it's also delivering energy to a lot of other tissue around it. And one of the mechanisms we have to um, manage this effect is to deliver another beam that is also going to expose some healthy tissue. But you can see that there's a bit of overlap of those beams now. So if you look at the kind of slightly darker area of the beam, you've got proportionally more dose delivered in that internal area compared to the surrounding tissue. And you can carry on with this and, and, and deliver multiple beams and find that you get higher, sort of a higher intensity of dose delivered in those overlap regions compared to the healthy tissue around it. And that's really the basis of all the radiotherapy we do. You deliver multiple beams, you get more dose in the regions that you want. You can make it um, a little bit more fancy than this and say, well, rather than just using a flat beam profile where you're getting, you know, dose coming in here and dose coming in here, you could modulate your beam. So you could have a different intensity across the beam profile. And that means you could spare a little bit of tissue in, in one position here or another position there. And if you do that, from multiple angles in the same way, you can get quite fancy dose sculpting. Um, you can take this to another step as well, and instead of doing, you know, five, six, maybe half a dozen um, different beam angles, you can choose to do four angles that are available to you, so a full arc. You can even give the couch a kick, so rotate the couch, so you can get arcs in really any any direction relative to the patient. Um, so that's, that's again the principle of dose sculpting. The way that you would modulate that beam is using these collimators that we talked about earlier. So the collimator isn't just a one single chunk of lead, it's usually engineered as a whole lot of little leaves and they're dynamic, they can move and if you move them in real time, you can get a beam profile that changes both spatially and temporally. Um, and if you play a movie of that, this is um, this is within the simulation of the treatment planning, so it's not a, a picture of the actual um, machine. But you can see in the lower corner, there's a there's a simulation of, of the the gantry rotation around the patient. And while that rotation is happening, the collimator is also moving in and out. So there's a lot going on at one time um, in order to get these modulated treatments. And again, that's part of what we do as physicists is to do a quality assurance check of all these moving parts um, to, to be sure that they're moving the way they're supposed to, that they move within the tolerances that we set up as safe tolerances and to pick up anything that's going wrong before it would have a clinical impact. Um, so, like I said, this, this movie, I suppose, is from the treatment planning system, but how do we actually use that to develop a treatment plan? Um, again, this is the 3D um, image information. Like I said, the doctor would has a job of drawing on or contouring the areas that they're interested in treating. And those are target areas. So, so they're saying, my goal is to get dose of a certain level into this region. They might also say, I don't want you to treat this tissue here. So it's hard to see with the colouring, but um, inside the bony structure, so inside that's a part of the spinal cord, so the part of the spine is the spinal cord. So although you didn't, don't want dose really to any healthy tissue, there are going to be some regions that are more important than others. And again, that's part of the medical professions to say, these are the target areas and these are the organs at risk. Actually, everything's an organ at risk, but these are more at risk than other things. And it might be because they're particularly radiosensitive structures, or it might be 
Um, might be for a, a cosmetic reason that if you're treating a breast cancer patient, you shouldn't treat the breast that's not being treated. So, so there there are different reasons that something might be called an organ at risk, um, and it's a compromise that, to some extent, is medical, but to other extent, it's just an engineering thing. Can we spare those tissues? Um, so the planning process itself, once you've contoured the regions that you're interested in either treating or saving, is to form a, an objective function to solve that problem. So this is, this is a relatively simple representation of what that function would look like. Um, you've got sort of, the, anyway, you see T's would be targets, OAR is organ at risk, U would stand for upper and L for lower. So there are different parameters in there saying, I've got a certain number of target doses I want to get and organ at risk doses I want to either avoid or keep above or below. Um, how can I solve this problem? It's not something you sit down and do with a pen and paper. Um, and it's not even really something that a physicist in a clinical setting um, would do but we need to understand how these functions behave if things are, are hard to uh, get solutions to and someone comes to us and says, oh, I'm struggling to get a good plan, what parameters can I change? Understanding how the optimization process works in the background helps you give good recommendations. The solutions that you get, uh, I guess, out the other end are really just dose distributions. So this would be a picture of once you, you know, you've pressed optimize in the algorithm in the, in the treatment planning system, it will give you a dose distribution. And it takes a little while to find that, that solution. Um, and if you don't like it, you can go back in and tweak some of your optimization parameters. Um, but you can see it's done a fairly good job at getting a high dose at red area in the target structures and less dose in the organs at risk and certainly much less dose in the spinal cord. So um, that's the treatment planning process. That solution would then be shown to the doctor and they will either approve it or not and, and give you recommendations for, oh, well, actually, yes, I know I said I didn't want that organ to get dosed, but you can give it a little bit more in order to get more dose to the target. So there's a lot of back and forward between the, the doctors and the planners, and then sometimes us as physicists saying, well, you could try X to, you know, to make your problem easier to solve. Um, very much a three, a th sort of th the three professions working together. Um, and that really just brings me on to, a, a, I guess, a summary of what those professions are. So like I said, the doctor is the cancer expert. They, they are the the profession that understands the medical side of things and is responsible for talking the patient through that and for making a prescription and for defining those things within the treatment planning system. And ultimately, the responsibility of the treatment lies with them. We're medical physicists. Um, we, uh, we, we are scientists by nature, but we're trained specifically in the area, for me, of radiation um, therapy. We manage general radiation safety components, but specifically we're involved in the commissioning and quality assurance for the equipment um, that's used in radiotherapy. Like I said, we're consulted a lot, particularly by the therapists and also the doctors about uh, treatment planning approaches. Um, and we do a lot of this sort of educational outreach, not usually to external people, but certainly within the hospital to the doctors and, and the therapists about, uh, you know, treatment treatment approaches and planning approaches that might change their practices. And then the radiation therapists are really the front line for a patient going through radiation therapy. So the picture at the beginning with the dog on the treatment couch, the people in that scenario are radiation therapists. They're the person who really presses go on the treatment machine, delivers the treatment, talks to the patient on a daily basis. Um, they're also the people who do the treatment plans, at least in Australia, so they, they have the, the lion's share of that planning job. Um, and yeah, um, very, very close sort of working alliance with us, but, um, but a different set of skills. Um, that's quite brief, <laughs> that's, but that's where I was going to um, finish up on what 
I do. I don't know whether it's useful for me to talk about what I did before and how I got here, or yeah, yes, I'm getting yeah, lost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I was just having a chat to Bram before. I used to work down the corridor from Bram when I did a PhD here, so I had a very different background from medical physics initially. Um, I, I wasn't working with gravitational waves, but I did a PhD in quantum optics which has a lot of crossover. So we used a lot of similar technology, I suppose the idea of using light and interferometers um, is a lot of the mainstream for that, that realm of physics. Um, and for me, it was a really, it was a really fun time. It was a great thing to do, but it wasn't, it was ultimately not where I wanted to end up as a as a scientist i guess i i enjoyed my phd process but i knew fairly early on that i didn't want to do academia i didn't want to go down the path of i guess just fighting for funding fighting for publications a lot of the sort of politics around academia and even on i guess on the the side of the interest in the science although the science was I think much more interesting than the science behind medical physics. I really wanted something that was much more applied, and um, I guess I'd had the luck. Of, I did my my um, undergrad in Wollongong, which offers a course in medical physics as an as an undergraduate course, which is not what I had done. I'd just done straight physics, but because I had been there, I was aware of it, and. I suppose being aware of it was what led me to look into it further and then ultimately I went down and re-specialised in medical physics. Um, and it's been a great pathway for me. I mean, I guess you've heard from three people with very different approaches to how they've <laughs> tackled science or used physics. Um, I wouldn't pretend I knew where I was going when I started out. I, I, I did an undergraduate in physics because it interested me and I liked it and I was good at it. Um, and I followed on and did a PhD in physics for the same reasons. Um, I don't think, uh, I mean, the undergrad was necessary for where I am now. The PhD wasn't, but it was, um, it was sort of a, it wasn't a waste of time, even though it wasn't what I needed for where I am. Um, so that was, I guess insightful for me to realize that down the track. Um, if if you're interested at all in medical physics, um, I guess the blurb for our our profession is uh, with a, the ACPSEN, it's the Australian Australasian College of Physical Scientists and Engineers in Medicine, which is a nightmare to say. <laughs> um, but they've they've got some information on on their web page of sort of pathways into the profession. Um, like I say, I didn't take the classic pathway because I dipped around with other things first. Um, I don't think that matters. I don't. I mean, I guess I don't. I don't feel any of it's a race, but that's easy to say from the other end. Sometimes you want to know where you're going early on. Um, yeah. Any questions? So if you're accelerating the electrons to delta in six speeds, does the machine have to account for relativity? No, because we're not really interested in how fast they're going. We're not trying to measure how fast they're going. Um, we do we do care about their energy, and we can tweak parameters to change their energy. So some of the things that we might change would be, say, the power in the microwave. So if you tune that back a bit you won't give such a kick to them as they're going down the waveguide. Um, but we're not we're not really trying to measure the relative their speed or their mass. Um, we just we just want the outcome of once they've interacted with the target material. Does that make sense? Do you have to dial up or down the magnetic field bending to do a magnet? In principle yes. Okay. Um, in practice the bending magnet is um, so, so yes what, what you'll do if you tune your bending magnet is tune for how far that beam bends around. Um, and because it's not, the beam isn't a perfectly um, monochromatic beam, it's yeah. got a little bit of a spectrum in it. And so when you tune your bending magnet, you end up letting through slightly different parts of 
the spectrum. Um, it's it's a narrow spectrum, um, so it, it's fairly forgiving, um, and the magnet itself, you really have to change it too much. But um, but yes, in, in principle, that, that is what happens. Yep. Um, it's usually something that you ask the engineers to do, and they go, why are you changing that? <laughs> yes. Um, the way you treat this response from like modern interactions, is that similar to like gamma knife technology? Is that something what? That's similar to gamma knife. Um, it, yes and no. So gamma knife is also a tool used in radiation therapy. Um, it's also an accelerator. Um, it's got a different process for modulating the beam. So what we've done with the the modulation. Um, well, using these, this, this is called a multi-leaf collimator. So they're just little um, tungsten leaves that can move in and out. The gamma knife, um, I don't think uses a multi-leaf collimator at all, but it's it's basically got the beam on a robotic arm that can move around in three dimensions, and it's a much narrower beam. So instead of using a wide beam that you then um, shield bits of, you just have a narrow beam that you move. <laughs> but but the the physics behind creating the beam is the same in terms of getting a high energy photon beam. You you have to start with electrons. Um, yeah. Good question. If you were dealing with the can with the like a cancer that required a high dosage that was very close to a sensitive organ, like say the brain, mm. would it be uh, possible or worthwhile to try and use sort of temporary insert of kind of radiation shield in the body? To the uh, we that is done in some situations. Um, interestingly, not usually the brain, but I can talk a bit about the brain. Um, typically, more um, I suppose places where you can put a shield in easily. So, um, some examples would be rectal cancers or uterine cancers where you're trying to spare the rectum. So, di well, different parts of that anatomy where you can use one orifice to access sort of other parts of the anatomy and put in a lead shield. Um, that is done. It's, it's not usually necessary because we have such high control using the planning to get dose to the regions we want. And the risk of putting shielding in is that you get, if you get radiation in touching the shielding, it'll then create scatter, which can <coughs> generate more damage to tissue adjacent to it. Um, so, so it depends a little bit on what the anatomy is locally and uh, how much scatter you're likely to get, depending on the beam energies you're using. Um, the, the best thing you can really do is to, to choose your treatment planning parameters very carefully. So something like the brain is um, an interesting example because there's, there's Obviously, a lot of well, there are structures in your brain that have if they get damaged. You have a really critical impact on the patient's quality of life. Um, but the advantage of the brain is that it's static. So if you can do your treatment planning carefully and you get a nice plan in the planning system, you can probably deliver that plan. Whereas in um, maybe a liver or a lung, you can get a beautiful plan. But then your patient's breathing. So the motion management side of it is much more complex. Um, and yet there's not much you can do with internal shielding in those situations. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's a good question. Um, there definitely are places where you can use shielding, but it's not used frequently. Um, more often than not, you'll try and arrange the anatomy so that you can avoid organisms. Yeah. Um, thinking about your answer, just maybe thinking about this. So, as the radiation, like from one specific beam goes through, yep. and it comes, whatever's left over comes out the other side, does it matter if that bounces off the table and back into the patient, or is that not something that happens? Doesn't happen a lot. So the table's typically um, a, a carbon fibre material with foam inside it, and it doesn't scatter very much. If you tr if the table was aluminium or something or uh, most metals, um, you do get back scatter. 
and you can see um, uh, so so one of radiation damages that you do see in patients is skin damage and you can see that on the back side not just the front side if they're lying on something maybe a belt buckle or something would cause that that level of damage it, it depends a lot on the dose um, but yeah it's definitely something to consider um, most uh, some of those, those pictures were a bit I mean, obviously schematic but um most of the dose that's delivered is delivered in the front surfaces and by the time it gets to the back side partly it's absorbed but also it's um, yeah, there's a full off rating so there is definitely less dose at the other side um, probably 10, 10 to 20 percent is left over by the time it exits the patient but yeah depends on the anatomy